Oh. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, before we launch into uh, today's program, just a couple of uh, uh, reminders. Uh, first off, uh, I'm glad that folks have been hanging in there with changes in the straw man schedule. It's uh, given us whiplash a couple of times, and we're trying to get the word out as soon as we know. There will be class again on Thursday. Uh, same time right here. In the meantime, uh, Dr. Rick Olson has a follow-up from his announcement uh, last week pertaining to the comprehensive faculty roster and uh, ways to locate people that you might need to locate, especially for those of you who have not yet uh, rounded out your uh, committee rosters. Uh, so I'll give him a moment, and then we'll launch into today's presentation by Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Uh, Tino uh, Perez on political science and social science approaches uh, to the uh, research on the subject of arms in the military profession. Now with that, I'll give uh, Dr. Olson a moment. Good afternoon, how y'all doing? Good, I know it's late in the afternoon. Uh, kudos to you for, uh, for staying awake and making this thing happen. Uh, last week I introduced you to the list that, uh, that we had put together. How many here still are looking for committee members? There is a vast number of you out there. Um, I guess I have to ask the question, first of all, is, is there a problem with the list? Is it not helpful? Yes. I can't find it. Can I look all through that MMA SharePoint? Yeah. It's right on the left-hand side. If you click on Student SharePoint, go to MMAS, go to Lists on the left-hand side toward the bottom, Committee Members by Directorate. Oh, there it is. Hey, th thank you for being brave enough. If you still got questions on that, I want you uh, folks to come and see me. Is there any other problem with the list? Anything at all that I need to know? Anything we need to improve on? This is for you. This isn't for me. All right, I want to get out of here very quickly, but if you're having a problem with the list, if you're having problems with committee members, if you're having problems with PhDs, I'm going to put my contact information, which I didn't give you a very good job last week, back at, uh, back at the table. If nothing else, to be brief, let me give you my cell number and text me, and let's get together and figure out why it is, uh, how we can make sure that we get you a committee member. My cell phone number is 913-683-1364. Text me, we'll meet, we'll go through the list if we have to, and we'll make sure that we can get somebody for you. I'll help you uh, all that I can. Comments, questions, concerns? You bet, 913-683-1364. Call me maybe, okay? Thank you. You know the song. Yeah. All right, good uh, late afternoon. And, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tino Perez here. And I have uh, two purposes. The, the most important one is to describe to you uh, some ways that, that thinking about things in a political science way might enable you to, to do some research in, in, in something interesting uh, uh, for an MMAS topic. And then also, uh, as a side effect of doing that, what I want to kind of do is be... Uh, an evangelist for political science as a discipline. I think uh, uh, many of you may have seen me before in front of the auditorium when I was talking about the Local Dynamics of War Scholars Program, and I uh, made the argument that we are breathing with one lung. Uh, next slide, please. And so what I mean is that uh, a part of our job here as military professionals and unified action partners is to understand thoroughly uh, how it is that we work together and for the, for the folks in uniform, how do we integrate the joint warfighting functions in order to, to bring joint effects? And we have to know how to do that. And the basis of understanding that is our doctrine. But then we also have to do that in the world. We have to do that in the environment. And that means we have to know something about how it is that our lethal uh, uh, application of power affects and is affected by things like governance uh, uh, at different levels, economic, civil society, ethics, ethnicity, identities of all kinds, et cetera. And so that's, I think, something that political science is able to do. It's something that every other major research university in the country 
uh, uh, teaches. And so that there are two approaches to studying the world. One of them is through history, but the other one is through political sciences, one of the social sciences. So I'll be kind of evangelizing for that as we go. Uh, I want to state at the, at the outset that mainstream political science, if you go to any journal, any of the top journals, eight or nine out of the ten articles in those journals are going to be quantitative. And I think uh, those who aren't uh, students of political science think that it's kind of a fluffy science. It, it's, it's pure econometrics. I mean, for, for most articles that are submitted, uh, high level regression analysis, and then when certain assumptions don't play out, you throw in econometrics in order to compensate. Very, very technical, to, uh, fee, uh, technical field. But I'm going to show you some techniques that you can use uh, that aren't necessarily, that aren't quantitative, uh, but they're qualitative, but I think are just as uh, rigorous. And I'm going to show you this uh, not by giving you examples of other MMASs, but I'm going to give you examples, and this is the same thing I do for my 8 to 11 breakout group of the top researchers in the field. So I'm going to show you examples of real research by real scholars, full PhDs, touching upon issues that are relevant to us as models for how you should do your work as, uh, as a scholar warriors. Okay? And then uh, I want to emphasize, just to, to kind of make sure we're all on the same sheet of music, what is the MMAS? I have a blog entry. It's, called, it's about a year old. I'll make sure that uh, Vanita Kruger gets and distributes it out. But this one describes at least my take on the MMAS thesis and how it is a piece of scholarship. This take is not idiosyncratic. It, this take I offer is indicative in every journal of political science that's out there, and I think in other disciplines as well. But first, the thing you have to do when you start your research is do a literature review. You pick a topic, and then you survey all the literature that exists out there that is, that is relevant to your topic. The reason you do that is not to summarize all these pieces, not to give an annotated bibliography, but to simply stake out the constellation of positions as they relate to what you're studying. And the reason you do that is to identify a gap or a shortcoming in that literature. That is, this whole group of people have studied, say, uh, what the PT test should be for the Army. And there's all kinds of different opinions, other militaries in other countries, other services within the United States, there's CrossFit, there's PX90, there's Extreme Fit. All this stuff out there has an opinion on what fitness is. And then you, you survey it all and you identify a gap. No one has yet talked about, say, functional fitness. I'm just making this stuff up. And then you're going to say, how can functional fitness contribute to, or ask, how can uh, functional fitness contribute to uh, uh, the Army's understanding of uh, physical fitness? Okay? And then you have to come up with a methodology. How am I going to answer this question? And then you carry it out in chapter four. But that's very basic. Your literature review is not the place where you dump all the literature that you're going to be, and introduce it for the first time that you're going to be using later on in chapter three or chapter four. Your literature review is only there to identify a gap. That gap then turns into your research question, which you then answer in accordance with your chapter three methodology, and you do the answering in chapter four, and that's a bulk. Okay, so that's where I'm coming from as I do this, and the examples I show you uh, will illustrate. Uh, next, okay, I'm going to show you a bunch of abstracts. There's a couple exceptions that are not abstracts, but the vast majority of what's going to come up on the screen are examples of real-world scholarship in terms of their abstract. Okay, I think that when you're struggling to come up with your research question, a way to make sure you're on the right track is to see if you can craft an abstract. And what that means is, one, First sentence of this paragraph-looking thing is write your research question. Two, in one sentence, maybe two, summarize the literature. Three, summarize the methodology in less than one sentence as you can. I'll show you what I mean by that. And then state your findings, I find that, or your thesis statement, I argue that. And then describe the significance or, uh, or policy implications of your work. Next slide. I'm not going to belabor this point, but I want to show you two student examples of uh, research that's being done right now. These are drafts. They probably changed a little bit. But this is a student, a uh, naval aviator, who wants to study uh, a, uh, a CAS, right? And what he's looking at are 
perverse incentives or rules that exist within a, a close air support that lead to unintended bad outcomes. And so the method that he's using is something called institutional analysis, which I'll talk to you briefly about later on. Okay? But you see, he starts off with a question. How should the joint force optimize the planning and execution of closer support? The literature, what's out there? Previous studies have examined close air support from the perspective of service and platform specific procedures. Okay, that's, that summarizes everything that's gone before. This study examines how the joint force as a cohesive whole can more optimally deliver lethal firepower against any adversary. Okay. Use, so this is how this study stands out from the others. Using institutional analysis, that's all he says about method. I examined three clusters of perverse incentives that hinder joint cohesion. These have to do with rules of engagement, interoperability, and training versus the real world. I argue, this is a thesis statement, I argue that institutions, which include rules, doctrine, practices, SOPs, etc., within each cluster generate unintended path-dependent effects deleterious to cohesive joint air support. I then propose a new approach to close air support that mitigates these threats and better conduces to joint cohesion. It's a great study. It's really, really tight. And it's really, really relevant to what we're doing. And although it, there's nobody out there in the political science journals writing about close air support, he's applying a scholarly methodology, i.e. institutional analysis, in order to lend rigor to his topic. Okay. Next, here's another example. I'm not going to read this one, okay, but it, it, if you make the slides available, Dr. Bauman, you'll have it in your slide pack. Okay. Next. Okay. So what are the things you can do in terms of a political science approach uh, on, on, on your MMAS uh, study? Okay. First, option one, test an, test an existing theory deductively by applying it to one or more specific cases. So you take a theory that's already out there on some topic, and you're going to simply apply it to one more case, at least one more case, and see how things turn out. Or you can modify an existing theory that's out there and test the new theory in some way. So next slide. All right. This is a, uh, so for my 211 folks, this might seem redundant. Just bear with me. This study here should be of interest to strategists, right? Yeah. Because what you learn here is that there's a very uh, uh, pristine, clear, and sort of uh, 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 bland procedure for how it is that we come up with our uh, strategic and foreign policy objectives. We have a strategic uh, US national security strategy, and then you go all the way down to the national military strategy. This one asks a question. Who influences U.S. foreign policy? Right. And there's three big clusters of things that could influence it, and scholars in the past have studied them. One, the population, the people, the, US, the citizens. Right. If it's a democracy, they should be uh, uh, leading the, uh, the effort on who determines U.S. foreign policy. The second one is something called epistemic communities. Right. We want smart people, informed people, making decisions about our policies. So there are people in think tanks, in universities, and in other special groups. Okay. And then you have organized interests, business and labor. And what this study says is everybody who's gone before has never studied which one is more important relative to the other two. And what this study does is it says, hey, we're going to do that study. Okay. Using extensive survey data gathered over three decades, the, that's the methodology, right? They find the following. U.S. foreign policy is most heavily and consistently influenced by internationally oriented business leaders, followed by experts, and then a distant third is the U.S. citizens. Okay? So what you could do, if you're interested in a strategic level question or a study, is say, okay, let's take Libya or Mali or Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan. And then go to the library and go to various sources and try to determine who influenced foreign policy the most and find out whether this theory indeed plays out in the specific case that you want to test. Okay, not bad. Next. This is a study, uh, the, the co-author here, uh, Isaiah Wilson, is actually a Fulbright colonel. He's at uh, West Point right now. 
a full uh, 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 academy professor. But he's arguing that in this paper, look, in the 19th century, you had uh, most states that engaged in insur insurgencies won. They defeated the insurgency. But since then, we've had, in the 20th century, insurgencies prevail more often than the states. What's up with that? Okay, the research question. What's up with that? And what they find is that mechanized power, for various reasons, leads states to go awry in the execution of counterinsurgency. One of the basic reasons, I'm not going to go into it, but one of the basic reasons is how do you get to know the population in an intimate way in order to gather tips, gather intelligence, if you're a mechanized force? And so he argues that it's a mechanized force, they argue, that the mechanized force, more so than other contributions to the literature, explains more of why these states are losing against insurgents. Okay? Interesting study. But you can take that theory and apply it to a specific case that, that you're familiar with or that, that you can become familiar with in history. Not a bad way to go. Next. Okay. Now here's an example of modifying an existing study. You study in C200 three IR international relations theories, constructivism, realism, and liberalism. And mo most often in the literature and in, in popular opinion, realism is associated with warmongering. It's an aggressive view of the world. Hey, I only look at power and capabilities and, and uh, hegemons and, and the distribution of power in the world system. That's the way it's perceived. But what these two scholars do is they say, look, actually, if you modify realism the way we do and understand it in a different way, we can apply it. Or we, and had we applied it in history, we would have avoided many of our major wars and still come out in a strategically advantageous position. And then they offer implications for how we deal with China and Iran. Okay. So it's an example of taking a theory of realism that's understood in one way, changing it up a bit, and then applying it to something else. Okay. Next. Okay, I don't think we're going to have that much time for questions. I'm going to try to go really fast. I'm going to leave you the slides. I'm going to try to go really fast. So what I want to do is, as you have a question, introduce it as we go. Is that fair? So don't, don't be shy. All right. Another thing you can do is theorize, that is, think through the implications for a piece or a body of literature for strategy, military planning, and, and the work that we do as military professionals. Okay? So there's lots of stuff out there. Let me show you an example. Next. Okay, so this is a study. Stathis Kalivas is at the top of his game. So if General Dempsey is at the top of his game as a military professional, this guy, Stathis Kalivas at Yale University, is at the top of his game in terms of the study of civil wars. He's the top. He's the best. Okay. And he co-writes this, uh, this paper. And the article observes that during the Cold War, most civil wars, that is wars internal in states, internal to states, were fought as irregular wars. Irregular being asymmetric, where the, where the state has heavy firepower and the opposing uh, insurgency has really small arms and nothing much more. Okay. But that since the Cold War, and especially since like 1994 on, the prevalent form of civil war is not irregular war or guerrilla war. They're synonymous. The prevalent form of civil war is actually something he calls symmetric conventional uh, uh, civil war, which means where both the state and the, the opposing side, the rebels, have heavy equipment. They have uniforms. They have organization, C2. It's not simply an irregular force with light weapons. Now, if that's true, is that in the popular conception of, of people's heads? Do most people understand civil wars to be symmetrical, conventional conflicts? If this is true, and there's pretty good evidence for it, then what does that say about our force mixture? Because there are people out there saying, we really don't need that many tanks. We really don't need that many uh, personnel carriers. We really don't need that heavy artillery. 
we can relax all that. Well, if this is true, this suggests that even though civil wars are predominant right now over interstate war, a lot of them are being fought with tanks, PCs, and heavy artillery, and CAS. And something to think about. So what are the implications of this study for our force mixture and for how we view the future? Next. This is a very good study, War Aims and War Outcomes. She asked the question, why is it that strong states lose to weak states? You know, overwhelming capacity for war, better training, better officer corps, etc. Why do strong states lose to weak states? And she surveys all these uh, contests between strong and weak states through, throughout space and time. And she finds that it's actually the nature of the objective that more often than not seems to determine winning or losing. That is, in those cases where a strong state pursues objectives that can be won by military means alone, for example, the seizure of territory or the decimation of an enemy, more often than not, the state is going to prevail. It's going to achieve its objective. However, when the strong state pursues an objective that requires some degree of agreement on the part of the enemy post-war in order to achieve the objectives, like an insurgency, more often than not, the strong state is going to lose. It's going to fail to meet its objective. Now think about that. That's stating whenever you engage in any sort of population-centric type approach, the deck is already stacked against you as a military, as a strong state. And that would be something important to know for a strategist, for a general, or for a battalion commander who's on the ground. Why is it that the deck is already stacked? And she goes through in the paper and describes the causal, me causal mechanisms for why that might be the case. But that has implications for our business, the selection of objectives. Okay. Next. Monica Duffy Toft, Ending Civil War, is another important paper. We put tremendous emphasis in the college on negotiations. In fact, you take a block of instruction on negotiations. And the presumption is that negotiations will lead to better peace. And so we as military professionals have to have some skill in negotiations. Well, Monica Duffy Toft looks throughout space and time. And she finds that when you have a negotiated settlement, more often than not, significantly more often than not, when you look out beyond the five to 10 year period, instability and bloodshed is gonna arise again. And you compare that outcome to when rebels win in a civil war, and more often than not, things are peaceful. Now, this isn't deterministic, right? This is a study that's contestable like everything I'm showing you here. People will argue with her. Like they'll argue with Kalivas, like they'll argue with the others. But it's something to consider as we're on the ground in an area of operation and we're trying to pursue negotiated settlements ourselves or we're working in an environment where those above us are trying to achieve a negotiated settlement. What is the force that's driving the dynamics, the empirics that she's observing. And it's something to consider. I'd rather know this possibility than not. So what are the implications for not only this study, but all the, the, the scholars and the scholarship that has been done on negotiations for, say, our curriculum here at the college? And that'd be a pretty interesting study. Okay, next. You need to drink a shot of tequila or two in order to, to enjoy this, this abstract right here. Okay. It's actually not an abstract, it's an excerpt. William Connolly is the top political theorist in the US. And what he does, and it's something that I really don't see often, is he takes complexity theory from the other sciences and he integrates it in, into political life. And if, if 
Clausewitz is right, mili the military and our world is a subset of political life. Okay. And he explores the implications of complexity for what we do in politics and especially political action. One thing you could do in a paper is to theorize the implications of complexity theory for ADRP 5.0 or, job fi or uh, joint publication 5.0 in the job process. What do I mean by that? This is a research question that I'm pursuing right now in terms of political judgment, of which, you know, obviously military judgment is a subset. And what I'm exploring here in light of this is this, this problem. Our strategies, yeah. our campaign plans, our operations orders, and our mission statements, each of those is in effect a causal claim. If we do this with our troops, our resources, our speech, and our unified action partner relationships, good things will happen on the other side. That's what a mission statement is. That's what a strategy is. There's causal claims embedded in there, and they're linear. If we do these actions, tactical, operational, strategic, good stuff will happen on the other side. But the problem is that the world in which we're operating isn't linear. It's nonlinear. It's complex. And so that oftentimes, what we hope will happen on the other side from when we do our missions never comes true. It never came true for me as a tanker with four tanks as a platoon leader in a simple scenario against the Krasnovians. And there was no media, there was no population, there were no tribes, no religious sects, no identities, no anything. It certainly hasn't happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. So to think through the, this, the, the implications of complexity theory for our business is something that needs to be done. Nobody's doing it right now. And it's significant because just a, several weeks ago, Martin Dempsey, General Dempsey, in light of what was going on and considerations about Syria and inter intervene or not, said the following. The application of lethal power seldom accomplished its intended objectives if ever. That was Gen General Dempsey, our top military professional, saying that what we hope comes out on the other end after the application of power seldom occurs. That's important. And that's what we're getting at here. Next slide. OK, another uh, thing you could do is to develop a theory. Right? Come up with your own theory, and then put together evidence that's not meant to prove your theory outright. We never do that anyway, right? We always posit a theory, and we're, we're trying to falsify it in some sense of the word uh, in the future. But this kind of is, is good for the kind of work that we're doing here at the, in, in the college, and especially in light of the time constraints uh, that you have. OK, so what is a plausibility probe? One way to look at it is you come up with a theory and instead of exhaustively trying to prove that your theory is right, you focused on the theory, on making it sophisticated, nuanced. And then you try to prove that your theory has plausibility, that, there, that, that there's a good reason to believe what we know out there empirically in the world, that this theory, my theory, holds water. And it should be investigated further. What's an example? Next slide. Paul Staniland, he's one of the up-and-coming scholars of, uh, of war. This is pretty interesting. And what he does is he's been studying war uh, in graduate school as a, as a young PhD, and he's studying all these different cases. And what he finds is, you know, we frequently think of war in the following way, and we think of war in the same way too. War is a clash of wills. And it's a clash of wills until the end, until someone wins. And we're not happy if we're a party to the war until we win. We impose our will on the enemy. We dominate the enemy. But what he looks at is he's, he's looking at all, all these cases of war. He's dividing up into want, wins and losses. And he finds out that there's a third column, draws. And he finds out that actually this draw column is really pretty big. 
In fact, most of the wars actually fall into the draw column. Which means that neither, the, neither side in a conflict prevailed. And then he looks specifically at civil wars. And he finds that by dividing the, the, uh, the operational environment in a certain way, there's actually six wartime political orders that emerge, at least as a theory. And you divide it in terms of uh, who controls what kind of land. So segmented, which means that there's front lines. One side definitely controls one territory, and then on the other side, the other side controls it. Okay. Or he calls it fragmented. And that's what we know as the insurgencies in Afghanistan, Iraq, where we look at an area and the insurgents and the, the government control different pockets of it. It's all broken up. Okay. And then he says there's three types of, uh, of uh, relationships between the opponents. One is active, one is passive, and one is non-existent. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about levels of cooperation. Active cooperation, passive cooperation, and non-existent cooperation. And you split that up depending on the type of war you're fighting, something like an insurgency or something like there's battle lines drawn. And then what you come up with are six different types of wartime political orders. Now, what is he doing? He's actually talking about our area of operations. In many cases, there is cooperation actively between insurgents and the state in order to uh, enable both parties to benefit from, say, illicit, illicit narco trade or some other illicit economy. There's cooperation. And that's not something we really talk about in our, in our doctrine or in our classrooms. Here's another case of cooperation. I'm marching along on a patrol with my troops. I enter the opposing side's territory. I greet them. I lay down my weapons, turn my weapons over to them, and I go into their territory and I do the business I have to. I'm done, come back out, my patrol gets his weapons and we go back out. The enemy is the one we turn the weapons into. That actually happens. Whereas a few miles in another direction, we're engaged in mortal combat. And so what he did is, he didn't try to prove this, this, this six-part typology you know, is a way to end all debate. But he said, let me give you examples. And he chose South Asia as a region from which to draw examples of each of these types of waters. And the one I just described to you is one of those examples. He is talking about our area of operations in a sophisticated way, in the way that nobody in our business really is talking about it. And he's bringing to light more factors that we ought to be considering, whether we're intel officers, we're commanders, we're S3s, we're civil affairs officers, we're psychological uh, uh, MISO officers. We need to know this stuff. And he's talking about it. Okay. Next. Uh, Stasis Kalivas again, the, the top dog here. He has another theory. And what he did, and if you read the article, is actually exhausting because he goes throughout space and time in order to buttress his argument. And he looks at conflicts, and what he finds is that the following. In a specific conflict, there is, and the terminology is here, is, is he calls it a master or a driving cleavage. North versus South, East versus West, Sunni versus Shia, Muslim versus Christian, communist versus anti-communist, etc. Okay. It describes the war at a macro scale, who's fighting it and why. But what he finds is that really isn't the motivation for why on the ground people are actually fighting. And what you find is local cleavages throughout the AO. And what's motivating the fighting here at the local level is not the master cleavage, first and foremost. 
was driving the fighting are private and local long-standing disputes that precede the war oftentimes by decades and decades. This is Hatfield and McCoy's type stuff. If you think about it, we have two scholars here, uh, Don Connolly in, uh, in DeJamo and, uh, and Randy uh, Mullis in, in uh, the history department, and they've studied the Civil War and specifically this region of the country. And what, what they find is that actually during the Civil War in Kansas and Missouri in this area, there were actually six different wars going on, only one of which was related to the master cleavage of North versus South. Now, if that's true, what Kalivas is trying to say is that this is not like an accidental side piece of a war, that this local cleavage and the cooperation between these local entities fighting around the corner and what's going on at the national level, the cooperation there, that's essential to war. That's the essence of these wars. Expect them. They're not nuisances. That's what you should expect the moment you step out of your Humvee or your vehicle. And many of you, if you think through and reflect upon your experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, find that, find that this is true. And what happens if you actually bring in like just war theory into this? In just war theory, we have, as military professionals, no obligation to state whether war is listed or not, whether it's just or not. We simply need to fight it the right way. And we trust our political leaders to put us in situations where we're fighting just wars. That's the traditional conception, Michael Walzer. Okay. We don't decide the justness of our wars. But if this is true, we're going to be on the ground right here with our units, giving orders. And there's going to be this fighting going on, and people are going to be coming up to us and saying, hey, those guys did this bad thing. Fight on our side. And now this soldier at the micro level on the ground is essentially making just war determinations on his or her own. Do I support this side or this side here? If I support this side, am I being used? Am I getting the whole truth? It's important. Not an accident part of war. Next. All right, another interesting topic, practices. And this is kind of a new growing field in international relations theory. You have behavior. This is behavior that has no meaning. You see it on the playground, you know, uh, uh, et cetera. Then you have action, which is deliberate behavior. It's action for an intended purpose. And then you have practices, which is what I'm getting at here which are, is repeated behavior, repeated actions that we then give a certain meaning to. And if you think about it, you know, saluting the flag is, is a practice. Using Pemesi PT to analyze the operational environment is a practice. Doing MDMP in order to do planning at, at the tactical level is a practice. Okay. So one thing you could do is, as a participant observer, that is someone already a part of the game, they're observing it close up, all you do is just take notes on what you see with a special eye towards paying attention to these practices. And in some cases, you might do a little survey work. For instance, one of the things I'm interested in is going in when you start looking at the operational environment and just sitting in the back of the room and watching you at the whiteboard trying to crack open the, some aspect of the GATT region. I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to the words that you use. Okay. I'm going to look at what things you put on the whiteboard. I'm going to listen to the type of arguments you have. I'm going to look at the types of products you produce. And then I might ask you a question or two. Hey, you had the, the responsibility of going to the board and putting a P up there and writing stuff underneath. Political? Can you tell me what political is? Oh, and you had social, right? Can you, you did that. Can you just tell me like, what's, what social is? Why did you put something here and not here? And just gently ask questions and write down the answers. You have to get human subjects review permission for this, of course. And some very interesting things can happen. OK, next, next uh, let me show you how this might play out. This is a study, international security. And he was looking at what, you know, as one of the several ways you could look at what happened in Iraq 2003, 2002 through 2003 leading up to the war and the war itself. 
And he applies some, uh, some uh, psychological theory in order to make the following claim. When we are looking at near-term objectives, we, because of our human hardwiring, that's everyone, doesn't matter about culture, we, as part of our human hardwiring, tend to evaluate, not always, but tend to evaluate near-term objectives in terms of feasibility. That is, we're really, really concerned with the things that uh, the people in this room, mostly military professionals, are concerned with. Can we get it done? Do we have enough logistics? Do we have enough time? Uh, how are we going to do it? Working through the details. But then he finds, with respect to long-term objectives, because of our hardwiring as human beings, identity doesn't matter. We tend to evaluate these long-term objectives in terms of desirability. Think about it. We want a stable, secure Azerbaijan. Long-term goal. Sounds good. OK, let's go. And he's arguing that part of this psychological hardwiring was in play in terms of considering phase four and phase five operations in Iraq. We were really, really concerned. Think about it. We were really, really concerned about how to cross the LD, about how to maneuver our forces, about how to provide logistics to take Baghdad. But in terms of closing up shop, in terms of phase four and five stability operations, very little thought went into it. And this is what you see. Uh, lots of people make these kinds of claims. If you've heard of Freakonomics, Freakonomics, uh, Dan Ariely is an example. This is what he talks about. Our psychological hardwiring leads us astray to make subpar decisions. Okay. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize laureate, I think it was 2002, a psychologist, but uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics for doing exactly this type of work. What are those heuristics and biases that make us stumble in terms of making good decisions about the future? Okay. Uh, by the way, there's another study. I didn't put it up here. And uh, we looked at it in the local dynamics of war. It's a book. Uh, it's been out about two, three years. But it actually makes a counterfactual argument. <laughs> And it's, it's really controversial, but, but it's rigorous. And this scholar makes a claim that had Gore won the election, because of all these structural factors out there, we still would have gone to war in Iraq just as we did. That it wasn't Bush neoconservatism or ideology or whatever but it was actually all these different forces in play in Washington that were leading us towards war. I, I don't know what to think of that, but it's an interesting claim because you can actually cite words from Gore and his event, and, uh, possible administration uh, members supporting war in Iraq as this thing's building up. Interesting study. All right, next slide. Another thing you do is juxtapose doctrine right, and our cutting and, and our understanding of uh, our business. Okay, so let me give you some examples. Next. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this one, but this one is exactly arguing that ethnic war, just because you have different ethnicities, doesn't mean that you're going to have ethnic war as a result. By the way, let me take a side turn here. This is a contestable, you know, as, as everything I'm telling you claim, but you look at a region. Okay? So you're looking at Rwanda. And we know what happened in Rwanda, uh, 94, right? A, a genocide, 800,000 to a million people, uh, slaughtered mostly by machetes. Okay? And you start to ask yourself, okay, this is different locations. And each of these has the same sort of socioeconomic background, same sort of governance structure, et cetera, similar in most important ways that we're interested in. And we find that insurgents, that, uh, that the genocide occurred here, genocide occurred here, 
Genocide occurred here, but it was slow to begin, slower compared to the other ones. Uh, genocide did not occur here, did not occur. Genocide occurs here. Now, the very fact that this is empirically true places into question the fact that just because you have different so-called ethnicities, the Tutsis and the Hutus on the ground intermixed, does not mean you're necessarily going to get ethnic violence or genocide. So that now is off the table. That's not the reason there was killing here and here and here by machete. So then you ask yourself, well, what was the reason? And what this author does um, is he actually looks at the different lo the local dynamics on the ground, and he finds that leaders who felt secure in their ability to maintain power were able to stop genocide, or at least slow its progress. And there's all kind. Of, this is this is in, this is immature, because a lot of things that need, still need to be pursued. But this is something that like we'd like to know, right? It's talking about patterns of violence in the in the AO. And simply because you have two different people's identities intermixed does not mean that you're necessarily going to get ethnic violence. Something else has to be in play. And it's worth worth thinking that through. So it's one example with respect to Rwanda. Okay. Next. Still on the ethnic and the uh, now we're gonna talk about kind of culture. This is uh, Fotini Christia. I think a couple of the students here have already picked up the book because it was of interest to them and uh, started reading it. Fotini Christia is at MIT, and she publishes this book in 2012 at Cambridge University Press. Todd, this is a great piece of work. It's a great piece of work to have by your desk as an example of what your MMAS should look like. Okay, so what does she do? She is interested in answering the question, why is it that different armed groups break up, form alliances, a little bit later on, break up again, form a new alliances, and do that as often as the example given, we change, pick up basketball team, teams during the course of you know, two or three weeks. This happens, it's an empir empirical truth that it happens. So she wants to understand what's motivating it. And one of the top theories for why this might be the case is, well, they're doing it because of identity. They're doing it because of culture. They're doing it because of religion or ideology. And what she finds is that's not true. And there's actually a precis, a precis if you uh, uh, Google Fotina Christian in, in the book, there's actually a pretty nice uh, multi-page summary out there, uh, PDF. But she says, look, you know, it's important to know culture, and it's important to know the deep history of where you're going to. But what you actually need to know, that's, I say, that's not, not going to help you. What you actually need to know is a sort of cost-benefit analysis on the part of the armed group leaders. So she's looking at the tactical level, the leaders on the ground who can make the decisions for who an armed group is going to fight and ally with. And she finds that it's a two-part calculation. First, the armed group leader determines, am I on the winning side? And then, if so, once this thing is over and I'm on the winning side, am I powerful enough in that state of affairs to get a significant piece of the pie? If not, I'll break up with that alliance and I'll join the losing side in order to balance it. And that goes against a whole bunch of theory and a whole bunch of empirical observations that have gone in the past. So she, for us, what is she doing? She's challenging the importance of culture, of linguistic understanding, of historical understanding, and saying, really, you want to cut to the chase? All you really need to look at is the cost-benefit analysis, as I've just described. Now, we're always hearing about cultural understanding. I think, you know, obviously, it's important. But are we learning a lot about cost-benefit analysis and looking at armed group leaders? So what does she do? She does a huge N case study throughout space and time of these armed groups, different regions of the world. And then she in-depth studies Bosnia in the 1940s, 
Bosnia in the, uh, the middle 90s, and then, uh, and then Afghanistan, late 70s, and the 80s. And she ends up interviewing face-to-face -face a lot of these killers, armed group leaders. So she does a two-part study, large and regression analysis, econometrics, and then also deep case studies in order to buttress her claim. It's pretty important. And the implications of her research for the military profession are pretty significant. We're not reading this. You'll never read this, at least in the curriculum. And if that's the case, who is she writing for? Like, who needs to know that, if not us? It's contestable, but it's a pretty good argument. Next. Uh, next. I took this abstract from one of the readings we do in Local Dynamics of War. Uh, the highlighted portion there. For a few moments, suspend disbelief and suppose that most rebel movements are pretty close to being large-scale variants of organized crime. The discourse would be exactly the same as if they were protest movements. Rebel organizations have to develop a discourse of grievance in order to function. Grievance is to a rebel organization what image is to a business. Okay, so what? How often have you heard the phrase, we need to identify their grievances? Whether it's an armed group or it's a population or whatever. It's like second nature, it's a practice to ask this question for us. And what Paul Collier is a pretty big scholar, and pretty important. He's saying you're always going to find grief. If, you, if your task, if you task yourself with the purposes, with, with the purpose of uh, finding grievance, you can do it. You're going to be able to trace grievances everywhere you look in an armed conflict. But it doesn't mean that what you're finding in terms of grievances is actually what's causing the war. <coughs> grievances are always going to be there. But that doesn't mean that's why the violence, why the fighting, why the clashes are occurring. And so you have all these civil affairs officers and, and potentially soft officers and uh, maneuver unit S3s, XOs, and commanders out there looking for grievances. And they're going to find them, but it doesn't mean a thing, potentially, if this is right. By the way, you have a bunch of people saying grievances really do matter, and, and uh, so do identity. So it's, it's a beautiful thing, right? All right, next. Almost all of my students hate this, this when I bring it up. And then they each, almost to a single one, love this book. They end up using it in the paper. So Chenoweth and uh, Stefan, I'm going to talk about Chenoweth here mainly. What she was looking at was the question of nonviolent sort of uh, efforts to get significant concessions even to the point of toppling a regime. So you, people who are upset, and they nonviolence and topple a regime. And she was really suspicious of this because she grew up and was trained as a, as a security studies scholar. And she describes the guns and bombs and all that stuff. And that's what she focused on. And she went to this one conference on nonviolent action. And she sat in the back of the room, and she really gave the presenters a hard time. Have you heard of this or thought of this or seen this study or whatever? challenging everything that was coming up. And then being intellectually honest, she actually decided to pursue the question further. And she created her own data set of nonviolent conflicts and what their outcomes were. Did they succeed or fail or whatever? And she compared it to violent resistance movements. And she found that by a very wide margin, Nonviolent resistant movements were more superior, were, were, were more often uh, successful than violent ones. Now, this should be of interest to SOF, civil affairs, people studying unconventional war, etc. Should, should be of interest. Why is that the case? Why, throughout space and time, do these nonviolent resistance movements succeed? What are the conditions in which that's possible? because that might help us out, right? And you're looking at phase zero, phase one options, and this is empirically true. That's our business, right? We might be more successful if we're aware of at least the dynamics that are going on here. Okay. Next. 
Next. Okay, let me uh, uh, summarize two kind of big approaches to political science. What we try to do, just like the historians, is give explanations for why human beings do what they do. Right? Why do people go to war? Why do they pursue a diplomatic uh, course of action? Why do, why do they lose, etc.? When you're trying to make claims about what people do, there's kind of two broad ways you can do that. One of them is you look at individual persons as rational actors. It doesn't matter who's in those shoes, you can assume rationality on the part of the person. And so that it doesn't matter if a lion comes through that door and onto the stage, any rational person doesn't matter what their religion is, what their identity is, where they come from, how old they are, what their socioeconomic status is, they're going to go in that direction. Okay? And you can make those claims, and we make those claims all the time. Okay? Marketing agencies make those claims all the time. Right? It's rational to assume that if someone has a coupon in their hand for what they're about to purchase, the rational person is going to use that coupon to make the purchase. You can predict it almost. And when you do that, you're looking at the human person within an obstacle course. Okay. And that obstacle course can have to do uh, with, with things that we can't change, like terrain or the distribution of natural resources, right? Or it can have to do with man-made structures, like the way this auditorium is arranged, right? Or whether the insurgency that, or the... the uh, people who are thinking about a rebellion are finding themselves in an archipelago or in the midst of mountainous terrain. Right? And we know from studies that if you're in an archipelago or mountainous terrain, that's an inducer to rebellion. Where if you're in an area where you can't organize, you can't hide, you're not going to see that much rebellion. Yeah. So we can look at the world in terms of rational actor and an obstacle course. Okay. Here we have... Uh, Structures, non-manipulable, or institutions. Okay. Once again, structures would be like climate, geography, etc. Uh, distribution of natural resources, even economic systems. Right? Whereas here, institutions are uh, things like the rules that we follow here at CGSC, the U.S. Constitution, uh, the rules that, that show that, that uh, determine how NATO you know does its business, UN charters, etc. That's one way. Okay. Next slide. Another one is to actually get in the head of this person and say not assume not that that person is a rational actor, but that person actually is something like a meaning infused you know, creature that what's in this person's brain matters. That whether it's Petraeus or Noggle or Genteel matters to what this person's going to do in that obstacle course. Right? Whether this person's Osama bin Laden right, or Mussolini or Hitler is going to determine how that person acts in this environment. And those are two different ways of doing analysis. Now, one thing that we want to do as military professionals is we don't want to take sides. But we have to know that these two things exist. When we talk about the importance of cultural understanding, that's what we're talking about. You need to drink chai, you know, spend time shoulder to shoulder, get to know each other. And only then you know, can you have a good understanding of the population or, or the enemy. Whereas over here, look, if I put a wire mine obstacle right here, right, and I put artillery you know, right here, Alpha Bravo 01001, I'm pretty sure the enemy's going to go this way. So then I'm going to put an engagement area right here, TRP2 right there. I'm going to kill the enemy as they go. I don't care what the hell is in the enemy's head. I'm looking at them in terms of a rational actor. I put artillery here, wire mine obstacle here, and the terrain is mountainous here. 
they're going to come here. I'm looking at them in terms of rational actor. And we do that in politics all the time. Both are necessary. Both are relevant to understanding human action. So we try to do both. In this case, one of the ways we can do it is by looking at stories or narratives. Right? What are the words that come out of people's mouths? What things do they write? What do they say during their political speeches? What do they say during the rebel meetings? And you can divide up these stories into three types. One, political. There are claims made about how the distribution of political power should be. Second, economic. There are claims made about how resources should be distributed. And then three, ethically constitutive, fancy word, but all that does is it gets down to the deep down meaning of who they are. Religiosity, ideology, philosophical systems. Right? So each of these things, each of these elements compose these narratives or stories that people tell. One way to study culture or one way to study the interpretation of what's in people's heads is to look at their stories in terms of politics, political elements, economic elements, and ethically constitutive elements. Previous slide, please, the previous one. You saw the study about CAS, right, the, the abstract? What that, he's not looking at meaning, the, the naval aviator. He's not look, he doesn't care what's in people's heads. What he's looking at here are incentive structures. So there's rules that are intended to guide us one way or the other. We find ourselves in the midst of it. There is no such thing as a perfect set of rules, as a perfect institution. Every set of institutions is suboptimal to some degree. And one of the things you could do, and this applies to a great majority of studies, is to identify what are the incentives that these persons have within any system whatsoever. And then how does that generate unintended consequences. Okay. So if you think about it, the reason we have an electoral college, you know, you have the DC, make sure you read the Constitution, right? There's a reason why we have the electoral college. I'm not going to go into it. But that electoral college had an intended effect, and that's why the founders established the Constitution that way. But through path dependence, that is, just following the effect of the Electoral College, that those institutions throughout history, it has an unintended effect on the way our campaigns are held today. Right? Without the Electoral College, the way our electoral politics goes every four years simply would not be the same. And so we have you know, calls to eliminate the Electoral College, etc., and that would have a different set of implications. But it doesn't matter what you're studying. You can look at things in terms of rules, which are equal institutions, the incentive structures they create, and then the unintended outcomes. Did anybody intend inflation with the various OER systems that we've had? No, nobody intends you know, inflation of the reports. But because people are rational actors, operating rationally within a perverse set of institutions, you get unintended outcomes on the other side. An example from one of the books we read, uh, you, you, you can imagine this. You, know, you have advisors that go and they tell a, a foreign army, hey, uh, another army, you ought to pay people, you know, incentivize them to go fight uh, uh, by giving them combat pay when they're in danger. So that, that motivates them to go to those danger areas. So what do you do? Well, rational people are sitting in the barracks, unobserved. They're going to go out there and plant ordnance. going to blow it up previously safe area, now what do these folks get? Now they're in a combat zone. Now they get danger pay. Good job. Did anybody intend that? It happens all the time. Uh, General Rodriguez uh, was the commander of ISAF Joint Command 2000, late 2009, October 2009 until uh, July 2011. This is a big deal for him. Okay. You go and through good intentions, you spend $400,000 
right? As an international community, you know, you want to give money and develop and all this kind of stuff. You spend four hundred thousand dollars on a schoolroom house that should have cost, on the economy, fifty thousand. So you just poured three hundred and fifty thousand dollars into the economy that otherwise wouldn't be there. Okay, good intentions. $350,000 is an extra big deal. Well, who's really good in Afghanistan at soaking up that money? Warlords, right? It's effectively, criminal patronage networks, mafia organizations. They can soak it up very easily. They can sniff it out and soak it up. Who are they in cahoots with? Oftentimes, the insurgents. So then that money, $350,000 now in the system, soaked up by the CPNs, now it's helping out the insurgents. And now, through unintended, or, but good effect, you know, we had good intentions, but the unintended uh, consequences, now this stuff is biting us in the butt because we just strengthened the insurgency. Another example from McChrystal was a counterinsurgency math. Right? You kill 10 insurgents. Great. 10 insurgents minus 10 insurgents equals zero. But wait, you killed two innocents. You killed 12 people, 10 were insurgents, two were innocents like a four-year-old child and an eight-year-old child. Guess what you just did? Through good intentions, trying to kill the enemy, you just created an exacerbated uh, insurgency because now more people, simply because you kill those two, are going to be willing to take up arms against you. Okay. So this, this perverse incentive structure plays in all the time. And why is it that we set up, as, uh, we forgot our lessons after Vietnam in terms of how to fight counterinsurgencies? Why do we put that out of our memory? Well, you could argue that the, the huge, uh, uh, difficult ramp up for how we conceive of counterinsurgency in the midst of fighting one was a result of decisions that were made long ago. This is big in historical analysis, path dependence, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> next. Again, I'm going to talk about one thing. I'm going to open it up to questions. Is that okay? Is it? I don't know if you've seen, I've got a blog out there. It's a video blog, YouTube channel, Arguing the OE. And I, and I produced that and put the videos up because I think it's, they're very, really helpful to you, especially on topics like operational design or army design methodology or on thinking about the end state or integrating all these different things you do in C400. I think it's, it's helpful to you to take a look at this. But anyway, the most recent one, I think, is, is the topic I'm about to talk about very quickly. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile. So there's three forms of reasoning, two of which you learn here, I think, in, in C120, the critical creative thinking block that you have at the beginning of the year. And one of them is deductive reasoning. And we kind of talked about that earlier today. But in deductive reasoning, you have a theory. And from here, you want to draw different hypotheses. Okay, plural. And what you want to do is you want to test that theory and the associated hypotheses by applying that theory to different cases. And the more cases, the better. And to the degree that these cases support the explanation or, in some cases, prediction, but I'm not a big fan of prediction, the explanations proffered by the theory, you're good to go. right? But we think, at least in the way we speak to each other, we often do deductive reasoning. You're taught it. I don't know why we're taught it. We, shouldn't, we should know what it is. But we don't do this, really, as military professionals. And I would argue unified action partners. Why? Because this is a scientific practice. What we're concerned about, if we're a scientist and we're doing deduction, is we're really concerned about the theory. This is what's most important. And by the way, in terms of logic, in terms of logic, like philosophical logic, if the premises that build your theory are true, it's an absolute fact, 100%, that what you, what the, the outcome, the conclusion is going to be true. That's deduction. Look it up. If the premises are right, the outcome has to be right. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, hence Socrates is mortal. But we don't do that. 
There's nothing in our business that, that, that first lets that happen, 100% certainty in terms of outcome. And two, we don't care about theory. We're problem solvers. We're warriors. Okay? We're thinkers. We don't care about theory, first and foremost. Another mode is induction or inductive reason. Here, it's the opposite. You have different cases. And what you do is you try to find commonalities. Some people call these stylized facts. And these stylized facts then allow you to create a theory. This theory is then meant to explain all these different things. Some people say we do this too. But once again, I argue, because of the stuff I read, that this is actually a scientific practice. Because people who do inductive reasoning are concerned about making a theory that can then be turned around and tested against more cases in this circular sort of relationship. We don't do that. We are not, again, concerned with theory. So Charles Pierce, philosopher, came up with this other mode of reasoning, called abductive reasoning or abduction. Weird word, but there's a reason why it's that way. And this is what we do, I argue. This is us, military professional. Right? And we are faced with a problem. AO, our area of operations, a problem. And we have all this stuff going on in the AO. We sometimes try to make sense of it with PMSI, you know, uh, PT. And there's different identities, you know, religiosities, languages, governmental structures, fighting sects, etc. And the only way to make, it, make sense of it is by getting out of our vehicles and patrolling the ground and, and finding out what the heck's going on. And that's our world. We need to come up with an explanation for what's going on. Hence, you know, if you've had any design instruction, the first question, what's going on, relates to this. What's going on in the OE or in the AO or in the JOA? If you can't answer this question, what's going on, you can't answer what do we want it to look like. You can't answer what's preventing us from getting there. And you can't answer what operational approach are we going to use in order to achieve the end state. It's impossible. The first thing you have to do is figure out what the problem is, what's going on. Now, what we normally do as military professionals is we say, OK, who are? And we'll use our wits and our intuition, and we'll try to figure out what's going on here. But as we notice, and as every leader, top military professional is telling us, in order to do this well, as military professionals, we have to know governance, economics, civil society, ethnicity, identity, culture, ethics, etc. Because it's all intermixed with lethal power. But we'll use our intuition. But if you've gathered anything from the studies that I've brought up, which is just a handful of a vast sea of studies, the things that political science is unearthing and the good scholarship unearthed, it's counterintuitive. It's revealing hidden dynamics that you wouldn't otherwise see. It's bringing to light how common, uh, common conceptions about the way the world works is incorrect. Oh, negotiations, good. Go, go negotiate. We'll get a good settlement. Shit, it doesn't work. Look throughout space and time, it doesn't work. Let's engage in this counterinsurgency campaign. We have good objectives. We'll get the people on our side. Hey, sir, uh, good, but the DAC stacked against us. We know that, right? And here's kind of the reasons why. Hey, I want each of you to take uh, uh, three hours every day and study culture. I want you to take one more hour every day and study uh, the language of the place we're going to. OK, so that's pretty cool. But there's like these other studies saying that that really is important, but it's not the crucial thing. Maybe we want to study some other things as well. Do you see how some of the things that we're finding out are counterintuitive? 
So what we do is we have a, a multi-professional here trying to use his wits or her wits or intuition, but it's going to fail. Yet we have all these different studies out there. Now we have theories that are established, mature theories about what's going on here of this kind we've been looking at. And so abductive reasoning on its own is this person here trying to come up with an explanation for what's going here. What do we care about most? Is it theory here or theory under induction? No, we don't care about the theory. What we care about in abductive reasoning is solving the problem at hand. But to do it well, maybe we can do something which I'm calling mindful abductive reasoning, which is we deliberately try to consult different theories about what's going on and what might have explanatory power for what's going on in the AO. Hey, sir, yes. Is that way of saying we're trying to figure out a, a, a deductive or inductive approach? That abduction is filling the gap of what would normally be filled by deduction or induction or induction. If it's filling the gap, it means the other two things aren't covering what I'm talking about, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, L let me complicate this a little bit, okay? So what does our FM3-24 say? What's counterinsurgency in FM3-24? And this is really sad to me because I don't know why this is the case. But we, we, um, we have the government, right? And you have the insurgency. And you have the people in the middle. In FM3-24, based on grievance notions of like People's War, Mayo, uh, Kitson, Galula, et cetera. It's a competitive governance. Who can govern better? The government, government or the insurgents in the, in the people's <laughs> eyes? And whoever does that better wins. That's FM3-24, right? That's FM3-24. But guess what? That's only going here, let's say we're in 2006 in Iraq or Afghanistan, to 2011 Afghanistan. You have this young major tell his commander, hey, sir, it's all about grievances. It's all about, like, the people and their poverty and ideology and all this kind of stuff. Because I read Mayo and Galula and Kitson and O'Neill and all these others. Because that's what we taught here. But actually, the literature, and we should have known better, goes grievance. There's a whole bunch of people who say that it's actually greed like, the people fighting the insurgency aren't really, they don't care about what the cause is. They just are doing it to make money or to be better off in some way. That's another theory for what's going on. So if you're the major and you say, hey, sir, it's all about grievances, you're not serving your boss well because there's greed dynamics going on here too. And then there's another one that says it's actually opportunity or feasibility, that you have greed and grievance all over the world. You have it all over the world. Why is it you only have insurgencies in some of those places? Well, some scholars argue you do have greed and grievance all over the world, but it's only where the opportunity exists. Money, a place to hide, donors, you know, weapons. Only in those places do you actually see resistance arise. And then today you heard is another one, Kalibas, talking about a master and local cleavages. Okay. And that's just another complicating factor Throw that in the mix. They're all right. One of the things your boss said, in, quoted in the Washington Post in Afghanistan, was nobody ever teaches us. He said, nobody ever teaches us how to get in the mind of that armed group leader. He'd been through, through this school. He'd been through PME institutions. He studied political science and taught political science. And, Major, and, and Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Brown, battalion commander, said, no one ever teach. So what is he doing? He's going online, <laughs> scouring the Internet to try to find out anything that's going on in RC East about local dynamics, about how this stuff plays out here, because it wasn't there. 
Nobody was producing it. And if you remember General Flynn, now director of DIA, right, but he was arguing at the time as a top intel officer in Afghanistan, we're not doing our so soldiers the service, the proper services intel officers. We're not giving them granular understanding of what's going on here. Does that help you, Stoney? I don't know if it gets at it. You can correct me when I, later on. Okay. All right, so one thing you could do with any question whatsoever, especially in these days of regional alignment, and I remember one of your colleagues got up and asked, uh, who was that that was visiting? The, uh, the commander of um, Forcecom, I think, was here. I can't remember. Hey, sir, given regional alignment, you know, how should we prepare for this? Well, if you're regional aligned to say, you know, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa or something, What's wrong with doing an MAS, MMAS, where you pick one of the countries in which you're involved, and you find out, oh, go on JSTOR, right? Don't go on the web, go on JSTOR, and go to the major university presses, Oxford, Princeton, Yale, Chicago, Stanford, et cetera, and look at all the stuff that's been written in the past two or three years about your country or your region. And then you come up with a framework with all that stuff, and you hope some of these theories are going to be complementary, they fit together. Some of these theories are going to be contradictory. They oppose each other. It doesn't matter. I want to know it all. And you create, via abduction, a framework that is a list of variables and how they may be related to each other that would be useful to military professionals and unified action partners who are going to deploy or be regionally aligned with this area in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's a beautiful paper. The methodology, abductive reasoning. There's a rich scholarly literature, I can give it to you, what it is. I'm writing a paper on it now. But then you come up with a framework. And that framework then helps anybody who's regionally aligned to a specific area of the world, it brings to bear the latest and greatest that's been written about it on that, on that topic. What a great study. And nobody's doing that because we're breathing with one lung. We're ignoring political science, even though it's talking about our business. Okay. I'm going to stop there. Uh, actually, last slide, please. The very last slide. This is just, again, one more time. Okay, stop there. Thank you. So once again, JSTOR. I, I'm amazed by how many students late in the MMS process, you know, I'm just talking to them. I say, hey, have you looked at JSTOR? So what's that? I mean, that's the storehouse where all the major, you know, journals, at least for political science, and I know a lot of the history ones, exist. If you don't pop that open and do a search, I don't know what, you know, it's not scholarship. Then you just write in an essay or a journalistic account of whatever. Okay, you have to literature review who's written about your topic before. Okay. Um, <clears throat> by the way, just so you know, the most recent stuff, two or three years, isn't on JSTOR. You'll be able to see it, the abstract, but to get the actual article, if it's written in the past two or three years, you have to go to the librarians and say, get this for me, get this for me, get this for me, as soon as you can, please. And within a day, they'll get you the digits and send it to you. So, because they can get it, they can get it, but, but you need to ask them. Okay. Other things, look at, go online, Cambridge, Princeton, Yale, Oxford, whatever. Look at those presses and do a search for your topic and see what comes up. There's a great journal, Perspectives on Politics. They are interested in making scholarship relevant to messy, real-world problems. And there's a big movement right now about this. And it's really exciting. I wish I were 25 years old. You know, it'd be better at both being a military professional and a scholar. But too late. You can do it. There's two blogs that I look at every day, and they're really, really good. One of them is called Duck of Minerva. And the other one is called Political Violence at a Glance, absolutely free. And every day they post uh, articles. Most of them are relevant. But they're, they're bringing analysis to real world problems based on their scholarly work. And it's top scholars contributing, not marginal you know, guys and guys, the top scholars. Very important. And then finally, you have, if you go to YouTube and you Google or do a search for Arguing the OE, you'll see my blog. Most of the stuff I have up there right now, I think it's 16 videos, it's mostly stuff relevant to planning, although at an advanced level. It'll be helpful for you now as you do C400. 
but very soon I'm going to be talking about more, uh, I guess, scholarly abstract things that are interesting to me in terms of political judgment, and that might be helpful to you as well. But this uh, description of abductive reasoning is the most recent one uh, two weeks ago, so you know, if you want to take a look. All right, I'll stop there. Questions, comments, critiques, you can throw tomatoes and I'll move out of the way. Anything whatsoever? Useful? Did you know this stuff exists? We have a department of history. We don't have a department of political science. We need a department of political science here. So that way you can stay till like 20 hundred hours. Okay. No further questions, I'll be done. Uh, I'm available. Third floor into JMO. I have my own office up there. Just search me out. I'll be willing to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks. Ciao.